Okay, this lecture is about leaky gut. I'm going to show you here the anatomy, let's say, of the small bowel, the colon region, just in general. It's an idealized drawing, but it's good. I've gotten a lot of stuff together here. Okay, so here is the appearance of the normal gut wall. Here is the appearance of the gut wall when it's abnormal. It has increased intestinal permeability, which is called leaky gut. This list, vertical list right here, is the list of causes of leaky gut. So for normal anatomy, the key thing is these red um, junctions between the lining cells of the gut. The gut is called the enteric tract, so the lining cells of the gut are called enterocytes. Um, the lining cells are also called the gut epithelium. Uh, the lining cells of a lumen, like the lumen, the center of the gut, sometimes you'll, you'll hear them called the epithelium. Okay, between the cells there's a TJ. TJ here stands for tight junction. I made it in red, like red is a stoplight. Nothing gets past this, and that's important. Okay, um, so there's a single layer of cells. That's all you have protecting you is a single layer of cells. All right, um, the little AMPs are antimicrobial particles released by a specific type of the gut wall cells called panath cells. Um, there's B cells in the lamina propria. The lamina propria is just deep to the lining cells. Okay, there's a, an inner layer of mucus right adjacent to the gut uh, enterocytes and that's the inner mucus layer. Then there's an outer mucus layer, and I made these little bacteria smiling. So the smiling bacteria are the good gut bacteria. They are your friend. They are also called commensal bacteria. We have a symbiosis with them, a mutually beneficial relationship. And the key thing to know about the good gut bacteria is they're fed by fiber. Fiber is the most common nutrient deficiency in Americans because they don't eat enough plants. All plant foods have fiber. Animal foods have zero fiber. Um, Dennis Burkett believed we should be eating more than 100 grams of fiber a day. Average Americans only eating around 10 grams of fiber per day. Um, it's felt by Dr. McDougall that people should probably try to get at least about 50, you know, as far as a man's concern. Um, you know, if you eat a plant-based diet, like I'm 100% vegan, you'll get plenty of fiber. It's really a non-issue. You're eating whole foods, you'll get lots of fiber. Okay, um, the key thing too is these gut bacteria, they take this fiber and they convert it into short chain fatty acids. You'll see that abbreviated all the time, SCFA, so short chain length of fatty acids. And by the way, just in comparison, the typical fatty acids in meat um, are long chain fatty acids, okay? Like palmitic acid is C16, for example. So it makes it into a two carbon, two C is for two carbon acetate, um, a three carbon propionate. And by the way, these are all carboxylic acids, why they, that's why they end in the ATE ending, you know? Um, Butyrate, and this is, this is when they're deprotonated, they have the ATE ending, okay? Otherwise, it'd be like, you know, acetic acid, for example. Okay, propionates, three carbon, um, four car you could also call it propanoic acid. Anyways, uh, four carbon is butyrate. So the two carbon and the three carbon, you know, two and three C, FA, fatty acid, they go through the portal vein to the liver. And the point is that the liver can convert them into... Uh, long chain fatty acids. It can use the two carbon units to make an even numbered carbon fatty acid. It can use the odd number of carbons propionate to make an odd number of carbon fatty acid. Most fatty acids in the human body have even number of carbons. But the, the big point here is the fiber is providing carbon units to make fatty acids. So you actually get your so-called good fats, as far as I'm concerned, the only good fats are what you get from fiber because it comes in in a very protected way. It's beneficial from the moment it touches your mouth till your gut bacteria make it into short-chain fatty acids till it goes into your gut lining. And the most important one is butyrate. Butyrate is the fourth carbon short-chain fatty acid made by our gut bacteria by conversion of fiber into butyrate. And the reason is that's more than like two-thirds of the energy used by the gut lining cells to be healthy and to maintain these tight junctions. So that's a super important thing. You have to know that. Dietary fiber is used to make and maintain the tight junctions of your intestinal lining. And the biggest problem with getting leaky gut, the big disaster over here, is a lack of dietary fiber. So if you want to have a healthy gut, you want to protect your gut, eat the dietary fiber, and that's how we have a commensal, mutually beneficial relationship with these gut bacteria. We give them fiber, makes them happy, they can eat it, and then they make short-chain fatty acids, which protect our gut. That makes us happy, okay? So we're healthy. It's, we both get a win-win here, okay? 
Um, these are dendritic cells. They're sort of like security guards. They sense what's going on um, <clears throat> in the intestinal muco in the mucus lining right here around the gut lining cells. Um, they're part of the immune system. B cells make secretary IgA that goes into the gut. It's protective. These are T regulatory cells suppress unnecessary immune responses. These are lacteals that absorb the chylomicron. So that's sort of just the background information. Okay, now we're going to get into leaky gut. So leaky gut means there's a defect in these tight junctions. And because there's a defect in these tight junctions, that's a disaster. Okay, when you have a bacteria here, the bad bacteria, this comes from eating a diet, especially of meat and processed food, because there's zero fiber in meat, and there's very little fiber in processed food. These bad bacteria, they will eat the mucus lining. The bottom line is, the way to think of it is, we have you know, co-evolved or lived for many thousands, who knows how, exactly how many years with these good gut bacteria. And our gut is like a good apartment for them. They want us happy. They want to enjoy their apartment. They take care of it, okay? It's a win-win. On the other hand, these bad gut bacteria, they're opportunists. They're freeloaders. They're mooching off us. They don't care. They don't give an SHIT if we live or die. They're just enjoying the time they've got in there, and they're going to eat whatever they can get their hands on. So they will eat the mucus layer, and once they get in close um, proximity to the gut lining, they can cause leaky gut just in that manner. Um, the lack of fiber makes the intestinal lining cells weak, and they can't produce adequate amounts of tight junction proteins, and these proteins will break down. The bacteria can get onto the deep side of our gut wall. By the way, the, the, the lining membranes are called apical membrane, where it touches the gut lumen. In between the enterocytes, it's called the lateral membrane. Sometimes together, they're called the apical lateral membrane. And then once you get deep to the tight junctions, it's called the basal membrane. Just giving you some of the vocabulary, you know, because you'll, you'll encounter this if you read about this more. Goblet cells are the ones that make the mucus. Okay, so anyways, once you have a defect in these tight junctions, the bacteria can get deep into the, what's called the lamina propria. Right here is lamina propria, and that's just the tissue, uh, it's like connective tissue, deep to the, the gut epithelial cells. All right, so when the bacteria get down here, now it creates a battle. Our macrophages try to gobble up the bad bacteria, okay? LPS means lipopolysaccharide, and that is an endotoxin released by bad bacteria, gram-negative bacteria in particular. There's also such a thing as LTA, lipotychoic acid, released by gram-positive bacteria. They're both endotoxins. They're both bad. Okay, the LPS get deep in here, and they will bind, for example, to our T-helper lymphocytes, T17 cells, and this will activate something called um, toll-like receptor number four, and you get this whole inflammatory response. Some of the APL, the LPS will get into the blood, and that's called endo because it's an endotoxin, Anything in the blood elevated is called emia, so that's uh, endotoxemia. And because it occurs after eating, eating, you know, the word is prandial. So that would be called postprandial endotoxemia. It's bad. Okay, so the reason why it's so bad is LPS is highly thrombotic in a way that's just incredibly exponential. It's a major amplifier of clotting. Just one molecule of LPS, and this is based on the research of Douglas Kell and Atheresia Pretorius, can cause um, the clotting of millions of molecules of fibrinogen, uh, becoming fibrin. And the clots that it forms are bad. They're bad in the sense that a normal clot formation with fibr fibrinogen to fibrin, it looks like pieces of spaghetti. And it can be dissolved pretty quickly by our anticoagulant blood uh, proteins and things like tissue, uh, you know, TPA, for example. However, these bad clots stimulated by LPS, you're going to get a change in the structure of the fibrinogen from being an alpha helix cylindrical protein to becoming a beta pleated sheet, a flat protein. And the, the net effect of that is bulkier uh, clots with what is called an amyloid transformation, meaning that the because of that, that switch from uh, alpha helix to beta pleated sheet, they're, they're bigger molecules and they're stickier. The, the hydrogen bonding is between the, the different parts, the different molecules, and it's just much harder to lyse. And this also is caused by infections. A viral infection will do this too. And if you look this up, you'll see there's a lot of literature on this concept of amyloid clots. Sometimes they call it fibrinoloid clots. Sometimes they'll call it amyloidogenic clotting. The bottom line is LPS bad. Virus uh, proteins causing clotting are bad. These little clots, they can get into the small 
uh, vessels of the heart and cause a coronary syndrome X, you know, cardiac chest pain. They can get in small vessels in the brain and cause, um, you know, occlusion of those vessels so they can cause cognitive impairment. It's bad, all right? Um, now, don't get me wrong. That's not the main problem with leaky gut. The main problem with leaky gut is localized inflammation of the gut. Because the immune system fights back. You know, the macrophage tries to swallow up these bacteria. Um, another thing that happens, you get big chunks of protein. You know, one amino acid by itself is just a solitary amino acid. Two of them is a dipeptide. Three of them is a tripeptide. And normally, you shouldn't be absorbing anything bigger than about a tripeptide. But bigger chunks of protein can get across these leaky junctions. And once they get down into lamina propria, the immune system, you know, mounts a response to them. And, for example, it'll form antibodies. The antibody will react with the, with the protein chunk. And what will happen sometimes is that the protein chunk, it's different enough to be recognized as abnormal, but it's similar enough that the antibody that forms to it will subsequently be able to cross-react with our own body. That's what autoimmune disease is. This is the most common mechanism of causation for autoimmune disease. So this entire process, of, it's called molecular mimicry because it's similar in some ways to our own proteins. Cross-reactivity, meaning that the antibody cross-reacts with their own tissue, autoimmune disease, you know, autoantibodies are attacking our own body. And this is thought to be the mechanism for most of these autoimmune diseases, these, you know, Hashimoto's, thyroiditis, Graves, um, uh, thyroiditis, thyrotoxicosis, lupus, and a lot of other autoimmune disease. And even, you know, with dairy, it's thought to be the mechanism for multiple sclerosis. An individual autoimmune disease can have more than one mechanism, but what I'm saying is you want to know about leaky gut. I would say it's the most important thing you can know about an autoimmune disease. Now, there's a lot of causes of it. Antibiotics are caused because they <clears throat> change your gut flora. You lose your good gut bacteria. The bad gut bacteria rise to greater prominence. Oh, one thing, too, some people ask me, oh, you know, I go back and forth between eating a meat diet and a vegan diet, and I get, you know, stomach upset, you know, bloating and gas and discomfort. Well, what happens is you've got, like, a, a, a challenge going on between your good gut bacteria and your bad gut bacteria. When you eat the fiber, you're favoring your good bacteria. When you don't eat enough fiber, you eat processed food and meat and oils, you're favoring your bad bacteria. And as they kind of go back and forth, that can lead to gut upset. On the other hand, if you're 100% vegan, you just eat the good food every day and that's it. <laughs> Your gut calms down. You feel good, okay? It does what it's supposed to do. Okay, oils are toxic to your gut lining. They increase risk of leaky gut. Sat fat is associated with leaky gut. Meat and dairy, no fiber in these foods. Uh, GP from the uh, non-organic uh, herbicide, you know, commonly sprayed on soy, for example. Other herbicides as well. GP was originally used as an antibiotic. <laughs> no surprise there. Excessive psychological stress because, you know, you'll shut down your gut uh, circulation. You'll get a little bit of a mild hypoxic lack of oxygen delivery effect because you're shutting down your gut circulation called the splanchnik circulation. Caffeine just mimics acute stress and sleep deprivation does as well because sometimes people ask me, oh, but I heard coffee is good for you. You know, like I said, there's a bodyguard of lies that protect any profitable food. You don't have to be a genius to read about the effects of acute stress and then say that something mimics it. It's going to have a similar effect. So don't be chumped by that. Okay, um, alcohol is toxic to your gut bacteria. You know, when you swipe a swab, uh, you wipe a you swipe a swab of alcohol on your skin to kill the bacteria before you draw blood, okay? It's powerful stuff. And don't get me wrong. There's different types of alcohol. And what you drink is alpha, alpha, ethyl alcohol, but it's still toxic to your gut bacteria, okay? Uh, my advice would be don't ever drink at all. Zero, none. Okay. I mean, even the one cup, one or two cups a day, that old stuff about it being cardioprotective was BS. There's nothing good about alcohol. Emulsifiers are like amphiphilic, amphipathic fats, meaning they're both somewhat polar and nonpolar. And they're, they're put into processed foods, and they'll also cause, um, uh, they can cause leaky gut. Things like polysorbate, carrageenan, and there's other ones. I think methyl carboxycellulose and there's other ones. Okay. Just being fat in general is associated with increased leaky gut. Being diabetic is associated with increased risk of leaky gut. Uh, the BT corn, non, uh, you know, non-organic, this is a GMO corn, that's associated with leaky gut. B the BT itself is sort of like from a bacteria and it irritates the intestines and insects and it can irritate our gut as well. High fructose corn syrup is associated with increased risk of leaky gut. HG is also associated with increased leaky gut, and HG is sometimes elevated in high fructose corn syrup. These irritant medications like NSAIDs 
aspirin and acids, PPI. Once you drop the stomach acid, you're more prone to SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth because you don't have the acid sort of clearing out the bacteria from the food as rapidly. Dishwasher soap because it's again it's amphiphilic, amphipathic in a sense, both polar and nonpolar, such that it can behave like an emulsifier. And I'm not sure exactly the mechanism if it's intercalating itself across the gut. Well, I don't know exactly the mechanism for that one, but I know it. It increases your risk of leaky gut. BPA, the estrogenic chemicals associated with uh, causing leaky gut. Uh, gluten and gliadin in some people can cause um, increased intestinal permeability, like with celiac disease. I also have seen people who were, you know, having problems with gluten, and then they became uh, vegetarians, and their gluten problems went away. But, you know, I'm not an expert on that. The big expert on that is Fasano. You know, Fasano's a bright guy. He's a pediatric gastroenterologist guy from Harvard. But he's also, you know, working on figuring out how can he make money out of all this. So he's not going to tell you too much. Um, OCPs, oral contraceptive pills, they can uh, lead to increased risk of candida infections, which can cause leaky gut. Artificial sweeteners, some of them are associated with leaky gut. I think in particular I read sucralose and stevia. I don't know if the other ones are associated with it. They're all unhealthy, though, and should best be avoided. Carbonated beverages, it's thought, are associated with leaky gut because of the phosphoric acid. Um, AL and HG are associated with leaky gut. I would especially watch out for AL. It's a bigger problem than people realize. Um, XRT, if you had radiation therapy, chemotherapy, that's associated with leaky gut, if you had it to the abdomen in particular. Traumatic brain injury, because it increases blood-brain barrier permeability. And by the way, things that increase blood-brain barrier permeability, they will tend to cause leaky gut. Um, having a stroke, for example, will increase blood-brain barrier um, permeability, and it'll also increase your risk of leaky gut. I actually think in acute stroke, they should make sure they avoid things that worsen leaky gut. TBI means traumatic brain injury, you know things like soccer and other contact sports. Um, let's see what else on here is interesting. Oh, by the way, it kind of goes both ways. And fiber, you know, fiber is your friend. It's the most important thing to protect yourself from leaky gut. Well, guess what? The blood-brain barrier also uses fiber. And I think it's a short-chain fatty acids. There's a little bit more to it than that, but I was kind of amazed when I initially read these articles that the dietary fiber we eat is protecting our brains. So what I'm saying is if you want to be smart, you want to be eating your plant foods to get your fiber. Okay, Corticosteroids will also uh, increase gut permeability, not good. Titanium dioxide increases gut permeability, not good. I wrote down leaky gums here because leaky gums can have a similar effect. If you've got real poor dentition, don't take care of your teeth, then you can get um, stuff getting through there. Again, LPS, bacteria themselves and big protein chunks. The bile acids also can get in there, cause more inflammation in your gut wall. Um, the high fat diets cause you to release more bile acids because the bile acids are used in a sense as emulsifiers to emulsify your dietary fat, break it into smaller pieces so your enzymes uh, from your pancreas can get at it more readily. Um, so anyways, that's the scoop. And if you've got any leaky gut issues, smart move is try to avoid all this stuff. And given that there's a relationship between things that cause blood brain barrier leakage to cause uh, leaky gut, there's some association like fiber to the brain that I would, you know, I haven't researched this all, but I would speculate that things that worsen leaky gut, they might have some effect to leak in, uh, some of them at least, to uh, increase blood brain barrier permeability. So you don't want that because anything that increases blood brain barrier permeability allows increased access of toxic chemicals to your brain parenchyma, which can impair brain function. Because neurons, in order to function correctly, they need precise ionic radiance. They need a precise uh, microenvironment, neuronal milieu, and uh, increased blood-brain barrier permeability just is damaging to that. So it'll make you distracted, less able to concentrate, potentially anxious, make you stupid. Anyways, I hope this was helpful.